Time Warner Cable is pleased to be an underwriting sponsor for Carolina Week. From the James F. Goodman Studio in the School of Journalism and Mass Communication at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, connecting campus and community, this is Carolina Week. The spring 2012 semester has come to an end, so in a best of edition, we will be taking a look back at some of the stories that have been making news at Carolina and in Chapel Hill. That's right, we'll cover everything from Trayvon Martin to the quality of your sleep and even memes, but first, tuition. For months, students in the UNC system protested looming tuition hikes, but it all came down to one vote by the UNC Board of Governors. That one vote, a 13.5% increase next year. Opponents may have lost the tuition war, but reporter Preston Jones learned it wouldn't silence the student protesters. Protesters shouting, We will be us! And beating on drums. Can't take it no more! Students in the UNC system say they've had enough. Students are obviously very upset about these tuition hikes. I think we feel like we've been pushed up against the wall. Kaylin Williams was among 200 protesters from campuses across the state. Police were on hand and arrested former ASG President Andrew Payne, handcuffing him with plastic zip ties. He was later charged with second degree trespassing and resisting arrest. He was actually thrown onto the floor right in front of me um, and forcibly dragged out of the room, um, kicking and screaming. He went to the bathroom and the police would not let him back in. He was already in the meeting. Still, board members gave the green light to another tuition hike, the one proposed by System President Tom Ross with an average increase of 9.9% for the next two years. Our campuses needed some help uh, to, as I say, put band-aids on the most serious problem. Now, if state lawmakers agree, and state students will pay $700 more next year, about $1,600 more for out-of-state students. After the meeting, students raided the boardroom, taking over the seats, throwing name cards in the air. Student body president Mary Cooper says the students made a difference. Um, the students are heard and there is no reason to be discouraged. While it may not be to the extent that everyone would hope for, we were participating and they were there. But many are still disappointed with the BOG. The orders to arrest anyone who tries to enter the meeting. Do they really want to hear our voice? Doesn't look like it. The tuition hikes still have to be approved by the General Assembly, an approval which may come this summer. When does accessible not really mean accessible? If you're a student or faculty member confined to a wheelchair on campus, you'd know. Getting from building to building, floor to floor, it's not always a pretty scene. Reporter Kathleen Whitty followed one such person around campus, and here's what she found. Like most freshmen, Meredith Kimple has spent her first year at UNC finding her way around. But unlike most freshmen, Kimple doesn't just have broken bricks and scurrying squirrels to worry about. I have a disease called muscular dystrophy, and I've used a power chair uh, since I was in sixth grade. Kimple took me around campus and showed me Carolina from her perspective. First, we checked out Gardner Hall, a 58-year-old academic building. Let me get into Gardner right now. So with most buildings here, uh, there's a side entrance, okay. and um, you know that takes a little bit to figure out where everything is. <laughs> you know, I like to get places an hour early or so just to make sure that nothing goes wrong. But things do go wrong. Even after using the automatic door to get inside, Kimball can't get beyond the first floor because of an old-fashioned and very heavy sliding door to the elevator. And with Kimball's limited arm strength, it's just not an option. Oh, that's a, like you have to hold it. You too, have to hold kind it? Kind of. But under university standards, this building is considered accessible. Of course, not all buildings are as old as Gardner. Saunders, for example. Because the ramp is just really hard to miss. Kimple can get inside Saunders with little trouble. But to get to the elevator, you have to go through this door. And, and it doesn't have a handicap? No buttons. It's kind of like a flaw in the plan. You know, they've got the elevator and they've got yeah. the outside, they've got the ramp. They did it all except that door. But what Kimple does love is this big elevator. Really good size for an elevator because you can take some friends with you. When it's working. Expect that, you know, machines aren't perfect, they're going to give out. Um, so I just think I've been pretty lucky that everything has functioned and that, you know, I can get most places. Again, Saunders is considered accessible under university criteria. That's what we're really trying to strive is for students to be students, to make this campus accessible. 
Jim Kessler is the director of disability services here at UNC and has been for almost 30 years. He's the go-to guy for students like Meredith Kimpel and anybody else with a special request for accessibility. He's proud of UNC's 97% accessibility rate and that only two academic buildings are totally inaccessible to wheelchairs and electric scooters. But still, he understands that accessible doesn't necessarily mean a wheelchair can do a lot more than get inside the door. Gardner did not come, was not touched in that first round of money. We're going to have to wait for some more money to come along. Uh, the funding for these projects comes out of facility services, and at the moment, it's not plentiful. Now, based on what the economy is. So how much would it cost to get an accessible elevator in Gardner? Kessler says a quarter of a million dollars. Even smaller projects, like installing an automatic door in Saunders, can cost up to $4,000. But Kessler says it's a lot easier and cheaper to install these devices during initial construction. Whenever we look at any new construction, we look, we look at access. And until then, Kessler says Kimpel and others in wheelchairs and scooters still have options. So, so if you had no. class that was scheduled on third floor gardener, I'd be out of luck. <laughs> you'd be out of luck. Would you just reschedule it? Is that what you would yeah, do? Yeah, I would probably um, tell them that I just couldn't, you know, mm -hmm. deal with this elevator. And uh, disability services is willing to like move classes around. Kimpel says there's one more part of Carolina that helps her get around campus. They're not, you know, just gonna let me go out. And people have been so helpful like I just can't stress that enough um, as great as like having ramps everywhere and you know elevators that work it's about the people too um, and I think that Carolina is extraordinary in that everyone is very um, considerate and nice and if you have any questions about accessibility on campus you can go to the Office of Disability Services in SASB. Trayvon Martin's death and charges against George Zimmerman has the nation talking about race and about justice. We have two reports tonight. The first involves the law in North Carolina. The second, a cartoon. Let's start with Florida's Stand Your Ground law. The law says a person may use deadly force if they feel threatened. What you might not know, North Carolina has a very similar law. Amy Whitaker has more. Signs, hoodies, and lots of yelling. Most of these students are members of the UNC Black Law Students Association. We felt like the criminal justice system failed Trayvon Martin and his family. 17-year-old Trayvon Martin was shot by 26-year-old George Zimmerman while walking home from a convenience store, unarmed and wearing a hoodie. Florida Stand Your Ground law has become a focal point of the case. This allows a person such as uh, George Zimmerman, for example, to kill someone and then say, well, I reasonably felt harmed. North Carolina has a similar law based on what's known as the Castle Doctrine. North Carolina Central Criminal Law student Greg Doucette explains. Your home is your castle. Someone was trying to break in. You feared for your life, thought they were going to do something bad. You had the ability to use any degree of force, including lethal force, to stop them from getting in. Last summer, the General Assembly passed a revision to that law, permitting the use of deadly force anywhere you feel your life threatened. Not just your home, making North Carolina's law almost identical to Florida's. The state representative who sponsored the revision, Stephen LaRoque, told me he supports the law now more than ever. He says every American citizen should have the right to protect themselves on their property and wherever they feel their life threatened. Critics call it a shoot first, think later mentality, and demonstrators say that's why they're trying to shed light on the law. In Chapel Hill, I'm Amy Whitaker, Carolina Week. And the controversy in the case doesn't stop there. In fact, it caused a lot of heat on our campus. An editorial cartoon printed in the Daily Tar Heel fueled the fire. Avery Harper reports. There are dozens of editorial cartoons about the killing of 17-year-old Trayvon Martin. But this one, published in the Daily Tar Heel, depicting Martin dead on the ground is sparking a hot debate at UNC. Black student movement president-elect Alexis Davis. It was kind of like a humiliation, sort of like a slap in the face to us. Students like Davis responded, flooding the DTH with letters, tweets, and emails. DTH opinion editor Maggie Zellner sent an apology email to offended students, saying time constraints prevented her from seeing the cartoon before it hit newsstands. I wish I had seen it, um, but I didn't. But I still feel, I still feel at fault. Zellner's response was very different from DTH editor-in-chief Stephen Norton, who says the cartoon was appropriate. I mean, to me, it was an editorial cartoon that was making its point. Professor Farrell Guillory specializes in editorial writing. 
He said effective cartoons are controversial. A cartoon doesn't capture nuance the way words do. Norton issued a statement standing by his decision. Some readers and even DTA staffers disagreed. I'm afraid that by not by apologizing only for the um, consequences and not for the decision itself, that he may have further alienated our readers. I just personally just didn't really like his statement that came out. Norton says he won't change his position. It's a, it's a matter of free speech. Selner says feedback is always welcomed at the DTH, even negative. You know, the day that we stop getting angry letters is the day that I've stopped doing my job. In Chapel Hill, I'm Avery Harper, Carolina Week. This past March marked the four-year anniversary of the murder of Carolina student body president Eve Carson. Both Demario James Atwater and Lawrence Alvin Lovett Jr. are behind bars, supposedly for good. So is that it? Reporter Caitlin Yannick sat down with some of Carson's friends and colleagues to take a look back at what it all means. The people who, who murdered Eve are, are now going to be in jail for the rest of their lives, but Eve's still not here, and, and that's the bottom line. That's Eve Carson's friend and fellow Moorhead Kane scholar Joshua Ford. His words are a grim and undeniable reality, but what her friends want you to know is her impact on this community didn't die with her. John Broder worked with Carson in student government. Eve is an inspiration. I mean, she was an inspiration in life, so she should certainly be an inspiration after her death. Meg Peterson and Carson lived in the same residence hall. I still look at Eve's Facebook every now and then, and people write on her Facebook almost every day. Still, four years later, people are doing things and they're always like, Eve, I went abroad this year for the first time. I did it because of you. And um, it's amazing. It's really amazing. Carson's death came just two and a half months before her graduation. She had gotten so close to achieving maybe the first of many really wonderful goals in her life, and it was all taken away. But her death may have also given something back to the community. I think it showed people that um, life is short and bad things happen, but people have tried to do good things through it. The fact that people are still doing things in honor and in memory of Eve, I just think she would, she would be really proud. Although you may have never known Eve Carson, and you may not think about her every day, her friends and others say you can rest assured she's all around us. She's a part of this university, a part of the goals you're working toward achieving. You may be her living legacy. I hope that you know, people don't forget her um, and, and strive to be more like her, because uh, it would be a far better world if we had more Eves. In Carson's own words, learn from every single being, experience, and moment what joy it is to search for lessons in goodness and enthusiasm in others. In Chapel Hill, I'm Caitlin Yonick, Carolina Week. Connect with us online by liking the Carolina Week Facebook page and following us on Twitter at Carolina Week UNC. Separate raw meats from other foods by using different cutting boards. 3,000 Americans will die from food poisoning this year. Keep your family safer. Check your steps at foodsafety.gov. Looking for these? You drive buzzed. It could be one very expensive ride. First, you got to make bail. Then pay me to get your car back. Your insurance premiums will go through the roof. And my legal fees just keep adding up. All told, it could end up costing you $10,000. Nothing kills a buzz like getting pulled over for buzz driving because buzz driving is drunk driving. So, same time next week? Well, of course. 
put away a few bucks, feel like a million bucks. For free tips to help you save, go to Feed the Pig. You didn't give up on sex. Don't give up on birth control either. There are more methods than you think. Find yours at bedsider.org. Between pulling all-nighters to write papers and going out on Franklin Street, it's no secret most students don't get enough sleep. I know I don't. And I don't either. And we're all constantly on our cell phones and computers. Apparently, that's not helping our sleeping situation. Amber Roberts explains. Television, Facebook, phones, all may be hurting the quality of your sleep. But how? Why is it that this television screen or this phone is keeping us from a good night's rest? The answer, melatonin, a hormone released when it is dark to make us sleepy. When our bodies are exposed to bright light at bedtime, the amounts of melatonin released weakens. Director of the Center for Health Promotion and Disease Prevention, Alice Ammerman, stresses the importance of quality sleep. A lot of people now are falling asleep to the television or kids have a cell phone in their bed, adolescents are there doing Facebook, and th that can contribute to the quality or lesser quality of sleep, which can be just as important as the actual duration. Ammerman also believes every person should be concerned with sleep, and some of the most sleep-deprived individuals are college students. If there's one thing college students know, is that we have to sacrifice sleep to make it through our weeks. College students sleep on average six hours a night, compared with the nine hours recommended by the National Sleep Foundation. Some of the health implications seem to be obesity, diabetes, uh, type 2 diabetes, uh, heart disease, um, where there's an inverse relationship. Those who sleep less seem to have higher rates. The lesson learned? When it comes to sleep, it's about the quality and quantity. So next time you go to bed, make sure to cut off the television, computer, and your cell phone, and get the recommended hours in. In Chapel Hill, I'm Amber Roberts, Carolina Week. Did you know that 884 million people, or three times the population of the United States, don't have access to clean water, or that more than three and a half million people die each year from water-related disease? Many of us don't know these statistics, but if you'll be taking classes here for the next two years, you may learn more about them. Reporter Tyler Ford explains. We drink it, we cook with it, we wash with it. Water keeps us alive, and for the next two years, it will bring us together. UNC professors Jamie Bartram and Terry Rhodes are behind the water initiative here at UNC. Bartram says the idea is that professors will use water as a theme in their teaching lessons. It's a, one of the very few themes that we could imagine that would actually enable us to draw together all the threads of what happens at Caroline. It doesn't matter if you're performing arts, if you're public health, if you're dentistry. Water, water affects everyone. Bartram believes all students need to learn about the importance of water. For example, for millions, it's not so easy to get. He had me try to balance a water pot on top of my head to show the measures many families take just to have water in their houses. Yeah, um, I, yeah I think your ma marriage prospects are good. <laughs> Needless to say, I need more practice. Bartram says students just need to know more. We can't feed humankind on our planet unless we do a good job with water. We can't continue to develop our industries unless we do a good, good job with what, the way we manage water. So why care? Hey, it's your future. Faculty Council Chair Jan Boxall says it's great to see Bartram and other professors so energized about the plan. Just seeing the enthusiasm of faculty, and the, I've always been an interdisciplinary person, so that's what's really, what's really nice. We can make a difference, and being able to make a difference is one of the def defining features of Carolina. So, if you're in a literature class next year and your professor brings up the theme of water, don't be confused. Just know it's one small piece of a larger plan. In Chapel Hill, I'm Tyler Ford, Carolina Week. Soon, rising high school seniors everywhere will start preparing for their future. And for many, that means applying for college. Filling out the application is just one part of applying to UNC. SAT and ACC, ACT scores are another, and they are very stressful ones. So the question is, are these tests good predictors of a student's success in college? Reporter Katie Murray has the story. Getting accepted into Carolina is a dream come true for UNC freshman Sally Falanca. 
But like many students, her SAT score didn't make her confident about her chances of getting in, despite the fact she had a high GPA in class rank. And I just felt at a complete disadvantage from everyone else. She thinks there are more important characteristics that should be considered that a standardized test score can't show. It's like you can't really, like doesn't really show the passion behind like their drive to learn. Wake Forest doesn't require the SAT anymore, and officials told me they're very pleased with the results. Experts differ, though. UNC Education Assessment Professor Greg Sizek has studied the SAT and ACT, and he thinks they are an objective measurement of student potential. Standardized procedures were introduced so that um, students from all backgrounds, all socioeconomic levels, all religious backgrounds and ethnicities would have an opportunity to demonstrate their potential for college success in a more objective and unbiased way. Sizek says the SAT is a good assessment of how much a student learned in high school, but it's not the only predictor of student success. You've got extracurriculars, GPA, and class rank. No single one of those really makes the determination. It's all about the combination of those. Even if UNC made college entrance exams optional, Blanca says she would still have submitted her scores. And although her score might be at the lower end of UNC's average, she doesn't feel less capable than her classmates. I don't feel like, I've, like I'm less smart than another student next to me who got a higher SAT score, and I definitely fit in this place for me to be. In Chapel Hill, I'm Katie Murray, Carolina Week. We spoke to UNC admissions officials and they said they are not planning on doing away with the SAT or ACT requirement anytime soon. And of course, we will miss this year's basketball stars when the season starts next year, but we will all remember their legacy. That's next in sports. So I got this new family and I don't know what it is about this one, but she can't seem to put down that toy all day long. Tap, 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 tap. Oh, and she even talks to it. She talks to that more than she talks to him. What's up, bro? Nice shirt. Who's she talking to? Her mom? She talks to her mom a lot. Congratulations. I'm sure you'll have many happy years here. Except for you, because you'll be gone three years from now, struck down by the same disease that got your father. Sadly, it could have been detected early with a simple test. For a list of tests every man should have, go to AHRQ.gov. I've seen and been a part of many comebacks in my career. To come back and win, you can't lose hope. Take it one play at a time. Grab every opportunity. And when you can, you make a big play. There are over 13 million people in the Horn of Africa affected by famine, war, and drought that are counting on us for help. As a team, we can help end this crisis. Text GIVE to 777-444 to donate $10. Let's start this comeback together. Together. Listen to your uncle, Johannes. Raisin bombs make you grow up smart and successful so you can be a doctor, a lawyer, a handsome genius composer. Like me. Feed your kids the arts. Visit americansforthearts.org. Welcome to Carolina Week Sports. I'm Clint Hanna. We know that Carolina basketball would be losing Kendall Marshall, John Henson, and Harrison Barnes to the NBA draft. We took a look into how they will be remembered at Carolina. Just four days after UNC's season-ending loss to Kansas, John Henson, Kendall Marshall, and Harrison Barnes announced they were going to the NBA draft. That may seem like a quick turnaround, but their decisions shouldn't come as a shock. John Henson, if he comes out now, He's going to stay, probably go where he's supposed to go in the NBA draft because he's just so long and he just does so many things. He's a great defensive player, a shot blocker. I think he can have a long career because of his versatility. Kendall Marshall, if you talk about an NBA-ready point guard, he is the closest thing that I've seen in college in a long time when you talk about size and smarts, basketball IQ. He is your classic point guard with Harrison Barnes. He would tease us with the spectacular. It just wasn't consistent enough. If, if he comes back to college and doesn't have a, a, a phenomenal season, that's another guy whose, I think, status would have been hurt. Barnes is perhaps the most polarizing of the three. A number one recruit coming out of high school, Barnes was billed as the next Michael Jordan and said he wanted to leave a legacy. 
And while he will have his name in the rafters, he's certainly no MJ. If he came here to build a brand and be in the rafters, what did he do to deserve it? That's my question. And he was very good. But if he wanted to be that guy, he stays for four years. Throw in Marshall and Henson's injuries, and this group could be remembered as the ultimate what-if class of Tar Heel stars. But after being in the NIT two years ago, Maniscalco says we should remember them for saving Carolina basketball. They righted the ship at a time where Carolina might have been able to go in a different direction. Harrison Barnes might overshadow what this group did because you always felt it should have been more, but they did, they did a heck of a lot. And they could do a heck of a lot more in the NBA. We'll be watching. In Chapel Hill, I'm Andy Reeves, Carolina Week. So though they won a lot of awards, Marshall and Henson won't be joining Harrison Barnes with their jerseys in the rafters. You know, that's quite unfortunate, Clint, but um, I'm sure we're all appreciative of the amazing memories they're leaving for us. Definitely. Thanks for joining us, Clint. Speaking of Carolina basketball, UNC fans have been using humor to talk about the season, but you may be surprised at where these memes originated. The average text takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. Stop the texts. Stop the wrecks. Visit us at stoptextstoprex.org. Traditional light bulbs actually generate nine times more heat than light. Switch to Energy Star light bulbs, and you'll realize just how much cash you are really burning through. Saving energy saves you money. Learn more at energysavers.gov. Have a kit so you're ready for any emergency. Develop a plan for what you and your family will do before disaster strikes, and stay informed during severe weather any way you can. UNC's loss to Kansas in the Elite Eight still hurts, but students are trying to use humor to ease the pain. UNC memes are becoming more popular than ever, but Danielle Elliott found out that the creator behind the popular Facebook site has ties with that other school. Aaron Lutkowitz is a sophomore Robertson scholar from UNC spending his spring semester at Duke. While you might think Lutkowitz has to keep his Tar Heel pride under wraps, it hasn't turned out that way. Lutkowitz is the co-creator of UNC's Facebook page for memes. The fact that I started it when I was at Duke certainly has made the process a lot, a lot more fun. Memes are an explosive internet trend most commonly used by college students to express jokes and specific references to their schools. At first, we, you know, we had a few people posting some good memes. We had a few anti-UNC people posting some memes that were basically just saying, like, way to rip off Duke basically, because we created ours less than 24 hours after they created theirs. Many of the memes on the UNC page fuel the Duke-UNC rivalry, and the most popular ones, you guessed it, basketball. And after this shot, the meme site exploded. I was up until, you know, 3 in the morning, 4 in the morning, deleting stuff uh, and banning users that were posting, uh, you know, stuff against UNC. Michael Hardison is a UNC sophomore and the other administrator on the site. He says the meme page creates a sense of community for the students. I feel like a lot of people kind of use it to commiserate with each other or kind of like, you know, communicate with each other, like look to other Tar Heels to kind of like, you know, see if they're feeling the same way. And that's exactly what happened after Sunday's loss when this meme was posted. It's the first to gain more than 2,600 likes and 500 shares. The creators say they're humbled by having so many likes on their sites and they're not looking for any recognition. However... Sometimes I definitely feel like the big man on campus, but whenever I want to like shout for joy, I met Duke. So what did Duke students have to say when I told them the creator of UNC memes launched the site while living on their campus? Well, you know, I'd be pretty angered because I hate all things Carolina. He's probably mad that he just didn't get into Duke. I'd rather not say that on camera. <laughs> yeah, I, like, honestly, I'm so shocked. I can't believe that that would happen only other than in, like, good fun. We didn't just create the site just to outdo Duke for the sake of outdoing Duke. I also just, like, love memes in general um, and, like, love to, like, see good memes. 
I love that they, the site was created at Duke. That kind of adds a little sting to the burn. Absolutely. <laughs> and I'll admit, I, I look at those memes for a good portion of my day. I mean, they're surprisingly relatable, you know? They're really funny. Well, we would like to thank everyone who works with Carolina Week, our crew, our advisors. Uh, they have done a fantastic job this semester, as you've seen. So thank you for all you do. And most of all, we want to thank you for joining us this semester. And uh, we hope you return with us in the fall. Have a great night. That is this last edition of Carolina Week. Good night. Thanks for watching.